I defer to my colleagues if they want to make any uh, recommendations. I would, Mike. I'd like to nominate Spencer Duncan as chair. Okay. Um, Spencer, do you accept that? Uh, I would accept it. We'll okay. see how much I can screw it up. But I'll accept <laughs> it. Okay. Um, um, I'll second that motion if, if it was in the form of a motion. I make the motion. Okay. Thank you. I'll second that motion. And uh, we'll uh, go ahead. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, Spencer? I won't oppose. feels weird to vote for yourself. <laughs> okay. Okay, well then, Spencer will be the chair for the committee uh, for this year, 2020. And Spencer, if you'll take over from <clears throat> here with the rest of the agenda. No problem. I guess we'll go on to item number three, staff review. Um, good morning, uh, chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nick Hawkins. I'm the deputy director of administrative and financial services for the city of Topeka. Um, with me, I have Karuba Kaseki, who is one of our management analysts. Um, this morning, we're going to give a brief overview of the transient guest tax fund uh, and then walk through a, a four-year history of, of TGT revenues and expenses. Um, and then we'll also hear an update from uh, the Sunflower Soccer Association. So in 2019, this committee uh, recommended and the city council approved uh, $560,000 in uh, renovations and updates to that facility. Um, they've completed, I believe, all of the work um, through those funds, and they're going to give an update um, this morning. So first, I'm going to hand it over to Karuba, who's one of our management analysts, and she is going to give an overview of the transient guest tax. Okay, so I wanted to start with some general information about the transient guest tax, um, which has been interesting as I've been learning about it. Some other people might be more familiar with this. But the transient guest tax is levied by local governments for the financing of tourism activities, and it is a tax on lodging rentals paid by guests renting for no more than 28 days and must be collected by businesses with no more than two rooms to rent. And <coughs> Curiosity and me asked why 28 days and why two rooms. And the reason for that is that 28 days um, does not conflict with monthly boarding facilities and two rooms so that it doesn't impose a burden on one or two room businesses. And this money can be used for convention and tourism promotion, so activities to attract visitors to the community, support for those activities and organizations which encourage increased lodging, and other purposes detailed by individual um, communities' charters. All right. I, I have a question. I'm sorry. Um, can yes. I go ahead? Yes, <laughs> okay. Can we get copies of that that you just read? Yes, yes absolutely. Okay, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the city of Topeka assesses a 7% transient guest tax, and um, I'll go into the, the allocations in more detail a bit later, but 5% is for the TGT base, 1% is to, for Sunflower Soccer, and 1% is to fund special projects. So that 5% TGT base, um, as I mentioned before, it's to support conventions and tourism, and it's also to defray the cost of providing operational services for those conventions and tourism functions, and to create innovative projects and activities that help attract industry to the city of Topeka. As far as the allocations, it is formulaic, and 80% of that goes to Visit Topeka to support the purposes of the TGT fund, including marketing efforts with outside agencies. 10% goes to Visit Topeka, and the remaining 10% is a, an annual general fund transfer to the Topeka Zoo. The following 1% that goes to Sunflower Soccer is used for several projects to enhance the Sunflower Soccer facility and grounds. It was adopted by the governing body in 2012 with a sunset date of 2032. And the two major projects that have been conducted under this are first, the extension of sanitary sewer to the property, and the second included renovations to restrooms, concessions, road improvements, parking lots, landscaping, etc. And the, that first project was, was paid in cash and the second bonded in fall of 2015. And as Nick mentioned before, in 2019, the committee approved a 560,000, um, an additional $560,000 to fund some additional projects at the facility. And 
as I mentioned before, the 5% base and the 1% the that I'm going to talk about later are formulaic. Um, this one is the only one that generates excess dollars due to the fact that the only budgeted expense are the bond payments, which are less than the revenues generated. Right, and the remaining 1% for special projects, the resolutions for this were adopted in 2015 with a sunset date of 2027. And the allocations are also based on a formula and distributed amongst four project areas, which are the Downtown Plaza, the Jayhawk Theater, Constitution Hall, and the Evil, Evil Knievel Museum. And the total in parentheses are what they should receive by the sunset date of 2027. And finally, the process for this committee would be to review and recommend 20, a 2021 budget to the governing body before the budget process, so that's around the beginning of May. And this should give enough time to make alterations before the budget is presented to the governing body in June. And the preliminary 2021 budget will be modeled on the adopted 2020 budget. All right. If you have any questions, I have a few. Uh, and I know you're going to go through this, but I just have some general questions. All right, so are there parameters as to what these dollars are supposed to be spent on once they're, they're given to an organization? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I'd say the 5% uh, the base is more of a block grant, um, and that can be used just as Karuba mentioned for those general convention. Uh, the Sunflower Soccer, the only obligation we have is for that bond payment. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about um, the excess funds that are generated from that and what those can be used for. Um, and the the four percent or the the one percent for the four projects, um, they have an obligation, so we distribute this on a quarterly basis. Um, and uh, there are contracts with each one of those um, organizations. They provide an update on how they're doing, um, meeting those meeting those guidelines in the contract, and that could be something that we could bring um, each of those groups in, since we've got a number of new members. Yeah, we're, we're, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But, but I'm question. I mean, but is there is there was there anything when the council passed it? I remember there was discussion. That's why yeah. I don't know what was actually. Yeah. But that said, these dollars have to be spent on bricks and mortar versus salaries versus something else. I, I mean, that's just um, an example of it. I'm not sure of the full history on that. I do know that um, with Visit Topeka and with those uh, four projects, there are contracts associated with those. Okay. So, And are, are they all up to date on their reports? Yes. Okay. Yes. So through, we just received in January the, the 2019 fourth quarter distribution, and, and we've received updates from all of the, um, all of the special projects um, as well as Visit Topeka. And the special projects are the 1%? The 1%, okay. yes, that's can, correct. Can we get copies of those? Sure. That'd be great. So just to clarify, yep, go ahead. are we going to get, we're all going to get copies of those last quarterly updates, or how far back are we going to go with updates for the last year, 2019? So, so do they turn in a, a yearly report or a quarterly report? Quarterly report. report. Yes. So could we, could we start with 19s? We won't, sure. we won't make use of this. I can only read so much anyway, right, to start. But if, yeah. And just of those projects. So we can, A, so we can see what they look like and what they're turning in and B, just get an idea of, sure. of where they're at. Okay. Mike, do you have anything? No. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so um, also uh, attached um, to the agenda is a, a four-year history um, as well as the 2019-2020 budget for the transient guest tax. Um, as Karuva mentioned, this group recommends the budget to the city council. Um, generally, that process happens in May, um, and then uh, it goes to the city council for adoption and inclusion in the upcoming operating budget. Um, also, as Karuva mentioned, the 5% the base and the 1% project allocation, those are formulaic. So um, whatever we receive, we just send out that formula. So those are, are pretty consistent. Um, throughout the last five years, uh, the TGT um, uh, for Sunflower Soccer does have a little variation. So we've got the base bond payment of 274000 And in the last several years, we've had some additional projects that have gone to Sunflower Soccer. So you'll see 2019 is when they received 
uh, the five hundred sixty thousand um, dollar allocation for those additional improvements, um, and we were able, I believe, to get um, all of those done during calendar year twenty nineteen. So that's why you see a, a spike in, in twenty nineteen for sunflower soccer. And the twenty twenty one budget will will look very similar to this. Um, uh, Lisa's staff were not proposing any changes to the um, allocation method. Um, so uh, what you'll see um, in the next couple of months will be a, a document very similar to this for 2021. Um, have there been any collection shortfalls? I mean, I know it's a percent, but obviously they were all, these projects were also guaranteed, a, at least in the, like some of these projects were guaranteed a set amount. Have we hit yet a point where we've had to say, um, Hold up, or or does this dollar or do these dollars have to be paid? Um, I do before not. That happens. I do not believe we've hit the threshold for the the one percent projects, and that's where um, it would go up to twenty twenty seven for those. Um, I don't believe yet that we've we've hit that target level. Um, as far as you know, revenue shortfalls, it there is some fluctuation in this fund, so. Um, just going back over the last four or five years, we've seen a 6% dip and then a 5% increase, and then it's averaged to about a 1% increase. Over so they get whatever that percentage years. is up yeah. until they're going to get their money. Okay. Yes. If that makes sense. Okay. I guess not right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, you did mention there have been discussions about the Sunflower Soccer whatever we'll call it over, you know, but what, what's the discussion where there was there, was there something in what the council passed or what the law, the questions where they can spend that extra revenue or. So, um, I don't believe anything has been decided from a, a committee or a, or a council standpoint on, on what to use those, um, additional dollars for, um, with the exception of the additional projects that have come through sunflower soccer. So, so right now it's paying for that. Right. So I, I would say generating, um, if we're just doing the bond payments, probably receive around $100,000 um, additional. We receive about 300 and just looking at the last couple of years, uh, about $390,000 in that allocation, and the bond payment is 274000 okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Is that it from your end? Yes, so okay. we'll have a mini transition as we get the next uh, presentation updated, and Sunflower Soccer is going to give an update on how they use the, the funds approved in 2019. All right, uh, I'm Alex Delaney. I'm the club director of Sunflower Soccer and Topeka Soccer Club. Uh, just going to give a brief update about what those funds, the $560,000 were used for. I've got some, some great pictures to make it easier. So uh, when I started, I'm pretty new with the organization, just August 5th of, of last year. So this is about what the field would have looked like. Um, you can see that the... Uh, Excavator had just started working on it. This is around September, October of last year. So during the build, you can see quite a bit of change. Um, uh, Mammoth turf, Kansas turf was out there quite a bit. Um, they raised the field level about three feet. Uh, Sunflower soccer is in a floodplain, um, so that will help with the investment. Uh, and this is a very, very high quality f uh, field, turf field. Um, so you can see them improving the foundations of the field uh, for drainage. And then this is what it looks like today. So when you're asking about what the money is spent for or how it's been spent, you can see it's a pretty drastic difference. Um, this is, you can kind of see in the top uh, left-hand corner of the photo, uh, that's I-70, or that's uh, Highway 75. So this gets very good visibility from the interstate. That was kind of purposeful. Uh, we'd like to see this used as a championship field so when we're talking about driving tourism or making Sunflower a destination, that was purposeful. 
Uh, as we grow as an organization, the idea is, is that we can have more and more events, soccer, maybe even non-soccer specific on that field to, to drive more interest out there. Uh, one of the things you can't see on the photo is uh, Love's Truck Stop, which we just developed a great partnership with, and they're just down the street. So we have a, a long-term partnership already built with them to drive people back and forth between our organization and theirs. So uh, I'll get into that community building a little bit later, but this is, you know, we're using this as the first step. Here's a little bit closer up. Um, Topeka Soccer Club is uh, kind of an initiative that started a couple years ago to, to organize and unite all the soccer clubs in the Topeka area. Um, uh, so branding it as this gives us a lot of long-term possibilities as far as tourism and driving people here. Something, you know, that would be a little bit spec speculative now, but, you know, there's long-term potential to have a, a senior side, a senior team that could drive in some tourism uh, by having such a great field. And then uh, a couple more pictures, but, you know, it's not quite finished yet. These aren't TGT funds, but we're going to be adding some fencing around the field uh, because, you know, kids kick soccer balls and they go everywhere. Also some backstops on the north and south end. The field is already, in, from the minute the, that first picture from the excavator has been driving interest for reservations and use, not just for the turf field, but also for the facility as a whole. So uh, it has made a really big impact uh, just in the last few months um, and not even being done. We haven't technically opened it yet. I think I'm the only soccer player that's been on it. So, and we get calls about it constantly. Um, and then we are expecting to see an increase in league participants, and that's outside of Topeka. So uh, Fort Riley and uh, Holton and the surrounding area. Now we're hoping that that can lead to some more hotel stays, more generally in tournaments, but even in league play, we'll get some more people at least spending dollars in Topeka. So that shows the, the transformation that went through uh, with the money that was given to us from this committee and from the city. Uh, obviously, a, quite a bit of a change. But I want to talk a little bit about um, our recent improvements as an organization. Um, since I've been around, uh, like I said, just over six months, seven months, uh, we've already gone through the process of developing a very solid three-year strategic plan. We're aligning a lot of those uh, priorities within the strategic plan with things set out in Momentum 2022. Things like kindergarten readiness, quality of, uh, quality of place. Um, one of the strategic pillars that we talk about is community investment. Uh, I've presented to uh, the North Topeka uh, Business Alliance and went through kind of our whole outline and it's very exciting because we're reaching out more and more to Topeka and Topeka businesses and organizations to become a better part of uh, what Topeka is and anecdotally I've heard quite a bit of how Sunflower had pulled away from being part of Topeka and that's something that we want to we want to get away from we want to be part of this or this community and and the region you know we're really unique in that we have we are a 501c3 so we don't have to uh, make a return like a lot of other sports organizations and we have our own facilities F and for a soccer club or really for a lot of athletic organizations that's very unique to have 46 acres of field and we are driven by youth development and not just soccer development but also personal development and making better Topekans so that's something that's very unique in this region from Kansas City over I have quite a bit of experience in the soccer world outside of Topeka and uh, I was excited to take this job because of how unique, uh, uniquely positioned Sunflower is to make a, a large difference in this region. So we are also looking to seek some new non-soccer spe spe uh, specific opportunities. We've talked to visit Topeka a little bit about, uh, about uh, hosting a Quidditch tournament and uh, I've talked to a local rugby club about making our facility their home. Um, we're looking at uh, expanding our soccer offerings to adults and people of all ages. Uh, so that just, you know, gives us more opportunities for increased revenue, but also to bring more people into Topeka for overnight stays. And also things that are even non-athletic. Uh, we've talked about having a, you know, um, an annual fundraiser where we can use our property, but not, necessar not necessarily the fields, to drive more people to Topeka. So that goes along with becoming more and more part of the the community and offering more and more things that are outside of soccer 
uh, branching out a little bit more to be more cutting edge. Uh, and then the last thing, like I talked about, is uniting all the soccer organizations in, in Topeka to give us more of a soccer-specific and non-soccer-specific regional impact. And the last slide is the importance of the city's support is, is many-fold. You know, if you look at soccer tournaments in Johnson County, the reason that they're so popular is because there's private investment that goes into building not even state-of-the-art, but good quality turf fields all across the city. Now, Sunflower Soccer Association uh, not only drives the tournaments, but also owns the land. So it's very difficult for us to, you know, to build that private equity to improve the fields. That's not the case in Johnson County. People buy the fields and then rent them out to Heartland Soccer Association, who fills them up with tournaments. Now, we don't have a finance arm within our organization, right? We don't have private equity funneling in millions and millions of dollars to improve our fields. But what we do is we try to leverage the fields that we have, which were donated to us, by the way, into something more than they would have been as farmland. And that's improving youth in our community and in our region. So it's a little bit of a difference. It's really difficult for an organization like ours to compete with soccer tournaments without having that outside investment. And the reason that we are part of the city's uh, TGT fund with our own 1% is so we can compete against Johnson County and Wichita and Omaha who have private investment or city investment in TIFFs developing that land and then renting it out to a soccer organization. We're having to do both internally and so that 1% helps us partner with the city and compete with other regional uh, tournaments and, and facilities. So moving on from that, advancement of youth and development in our uh, youth development in our region. We're looking to grow players from three years old to 18 years old. And we've already talked to our coaches about how the technical soccer skills are secondary to the personality skills that we're trying to build for Topeka. Because maybe 10% of our, our players will play in college, but 100% will be employed probably in, in Shawnee County. right? So that's really important that we're building good employees, good people, good citizens first, and then really good soccer players after. Uh, we, again, want to op uh, have an opportunity for physical and personal growth within the city. We've talked, you know, I think even in this committee about having walking track uh, inside our facility, uh, having other sports besides soccer, adult leagues, so then everybody has the opportunity to come play. And then, um, you know, one of my biggest priorities is making Sunflower Soccer in North Topeka, uh, a great place to look at for quality of place. You know, you talk about the library. Does the, li does the library uh, drive economic development? Of course it does, because when businesses are looking to come here, they see a great, you know, nationally renowned library, and they say, well, that's something we can tell our employees about. We want Sunflower Soccer to be the exact same thing. We have great youth leagues, we have great culture, we've got a great facility, and that will drive employers to give something unique to their employees, right? So that's all I have. I've, I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can. I did bring a, a board member with me who may be able to answer questions that I can't, uh, but I'll go ahead and sit down unless you have something for me specifically. Thank you. Appreciate it. Questions? I do. Uh, as part of your strategic three-year plan, are you incorporating uh, plans to get more private dollars? We are, yes, very much so. Uh, that's part of the reason I went and talked to a business organization. Uh, sorry, Tom Underwood is here from NODO. Uh, and we are very actively trying to recruit uh, fundraising um, and using our ability to market for private businesses uh, and then make it you know, tax deductible for them because we are a 501c3. So we're very, very actively um, trying to increase our revenue through fundraising. And also, when you talk about youth development, what exactly does that entail? What extra steps are you all doing above and beyond providing a field? And Yeah. Oh, you know? I, I, you, I could talk about that all day. I well, maybe just give me some okay. highlights. <laughs> yeah, so I'll give you an example. Um, so I serve on a number of boards myself. I serve on Communities and Schools of Mid-America and Junior Achievements um, Board in the city of Topeka and a number of others. So poverty and education are mo some of my main um, it loves or passions. And so I've reached out to Child Care Aware 
to start developing kindergarten readiness programs that we can build into our soccer programs. So I run what's called mini kickers in our league, and that's three and four year olds, uh, three and four year olds. And so we're starting to develop an emotional readiness, social readiness for kindergarten while we're teaching them soccer skills. So we're training our coaches about how you talk to kids at specific ages and how do they respond well. We're also working with uh, Spencer will appreciate this, I think. Kansas Leadership Center about developing leadership uh, programs when we're talking about coach development. Because without developing good coaches, we're not going to develop good players or good people. So coach development is one of our very most important uh, 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 initiatives over the next three years. And so how do we develop good leaders and coaches and good people and players is the most important thing. Kindergarten readiness is a big thing. Emotional uh, intelligence is a big thing. Coaches who can talk to young people and develop them personally is a big thing for us. Those are all part of our three-year plan. Okay, and that that sounds really good. Are you when you're talking about poverty and education, uh, then are you reaching out to underserved communities to work with these kids, these We're, young kids, like yeah. Community Action, their Head Start program, or you know connections that they may have, and I guess the other. Part of that question is because in the Latino community, in the Mexicano community, and in the Central American community, football mm -hmm. is seen as the driving sport, and there are many teams in this area. Are they also part of this init initiative in uh, bringing uh, Latino, you know, uh, groups to play at this at this field and, and part of this organization of Topeka teams that you're talking about. Yeah, so that's a really complicated question. You know, Topeka has uh, Topeka is a lot bigger than people think, and you know, um, it, it's going to take a while. And I tell everybody this is a process, right? But that is our ultimate goal, and to be able to offer those our facilities to players from every background and every social economic class. Uh, I was also a super poor kid growing up, so that's something that's close to my heart, which is why I relate so much to poverty and education. But I will tell you that we're, we, uh, we're blessed to have a board member that uh, works at Boys and Girls Club of Topeka, and so we're partnering with them to offer some programming uh, and our facilities if they would like to use it. Uh, we're half, I'm, I'm actively trying to work on building a bus stop out to our facility so kids who can't afford transportation can make it out to our place at least to be able to come and play. I'm... I and I can, I think, speak for the board to say that we are very open to making sure that we are as, as inclusive as possible and building whatever relationships are necessary to make that happen. So is that a yes or a no? That's an absolute, firm, uh, emphatic yes. Uh, so you are working with the Spanish-speaking population. It's mostly the parents that may yes. be not as proficient in English, but the kids are all bilingual. So the, yes. those teams will be part of this organizing of the unity of Topeka teams to play out at the field. Yes, and I will say that that's already started. It started before, but I, mm -hmm. I think that we can uh, we can even see an increase now because we are affordable, and uh, the larger that unity makes us even more affordable because we have more collective bargaining power, and mm -hmm. so we can offer those kids scholarships or meet whatever needs to bridge the gap of whatever they uh, don't have to make that opportunity possible for them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think you partially answered uh, what I was going to ask. Uh, you mentioned uh, the number of clubs. Can you, do you have a specific number of how many clubs you do have in the league? Have they grown, you know, in organizing and bringing together those clubs? How many clubs do you have participating, do you think? Um, over a dozen, which, okay. y you know, is... Speaking to our region is quite a few because there aren't that many soccer clubs in this area just mm -hmm. because of the geographic distance between everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but Salina, um, Sporting Cove Valley, BVB and Lawrence, um, some Holton teams, there's a lot of independent clubs within and outside of Topeka. So I'd say over a dozen for sure. Okay. And I think we're expecting to that to increase even this spring season. And you mentioned affordable and mm -hmm. being able to offer scholarships for those who may not uh, have the resources and means, how does that happen? Is that, is that an outreach effort uh, through the schools or through uh, some other organizations? Uh, um, oftentimes uh, when we speak about opportunity, uh, the opportunity is there, but unless there's an outreach right. uh, effort, sometimes that message just doesn't get there. 
So what efforts do you make in that area? Right now we're seeing a lot of organic growth in that because our focus is internally and in, in making sure that we're taking care of our existing members as well as possible. Like I said, this is a process. Our goal is to start some school outreach and other community outreach like with Boys and Girls Club uh, to make sure that they know that soccer is affordable for them even if it is based on scholarship. Uh, we've also done things like we just signed a six-year deal with uh, Puma, the, the equipment supplier, and they're giving us $65,000 a year in sponsorship funds for kids who can't afford soccer, and that's going to make a huge difference. They can pay for their uniforms, whatever equipment they need, and also, um, you know, help towards pay for the, mm -hmm. the operating funds for us. So that makes a huge difference. That's something that didn't happen the last time we were in front of your the podium. That's something that I did as one of my first initiatives here, knowing that that would help offset our operating funds, which then we can push as a nonprofit to helping be more inclusive and create more opportunity. And if I may follow yeah. up. And, and to follow along with that, um, I know you might not have direct uh, opportunity to recruit, but is your coaching staff a diverse group of, of coaches? Very. Uh, good, because I think that's important uh, to draw that youth, uh, diverse youth, uh, into the programs. So I was just yeah. wondering about that. And uh, we within the office have, uh, I would say it's a f official stance to make sure we have as much, as many bilingual English Spanish speakers as possible because we do recognize our population and some of the limitations they have in generational limitations. Not to mention the fact that so much of the game that we love is grounded in Latin American roots, especially in this area. So that's something that we respect, you know, no matter who we are. So that's that's a very important part of, you know, having a diverse uh, coaching staff, you know, gender diverse and then ethnically diverse is important. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more. Yep. And then adding on to that, um, you said with the Boys and Girls Club, you were going to be doing outreach. Again, I would strongly encourage, uh, you know, community action, uh, Tawny Stottlemyer uh, is steeped well into the Spanish-speaking community, uh, also with the Salvation Army, because right now the Salvation Army is working with a couple of people that have uh, done boxing for years and working with TPD um, through Police Athletic League and the Fire Department to start, and Mike's a part of this as well, but starting a, a boxing team for kids. So in that area of Southeast 6th Street, which is part of District 2 and part of District 3, there is a wealth of children there that are needing yeah. this type of encouragement. And my suggestion also would be that if you do have a diverse group, uh, again, while the kids are, are bilingual, their parents often uh, read in their first language, which is Spanish. So any type of outreach that you do that has any flyers associated with it, I would just be cognizant of the fact that, you know, printing it in Spanish right. is, is something that would be very helpful. Right. But thank you for, yeah. for that. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Anything else you would like to add? No. Just, uh, you know, we appreciate, I th like I said, I think that anecdotally, from everything I understand, that our organization has maybe pulled back from being part of the community and not wanted to build those community connections. And that's the polar opposite of the way that I think. Without building those community connections with the city of Topeka, with other nonprofits and for-profit organizations, nobody wins, especially us. We can't do it alone and we don't want to anymore. So we're skewing that that idea of being an island out there, and we're trying to re-engage as part of the community. Thank you very much. You're free. You're free. <laughs> All right. Other items. I have one item, but does anyone else have other items? Staff, do you have any other items you'd like to toss um, in there? No, Anything I think we've left out or you'd like we'll, us to know. We'll work on uh, getting those reports and, and contracts to you for your review and try and get those this week. And then I think uh, whenever the next meeting is, we'll, we'll try and have a, a 2021 proposed budget for you to review as well. Anything for you? 
just to recognize uh, Kurt uh, and Mike and Bell in the, in the audience here, um, it's always good to see you guys here. And uh, Any updates you might want to offer uh, on the progress of the plaza or ev anything else? opportunity. <laughs> so, Kurt Young, uh, Executive Director of the Topeka Lodging Association. Uh, it, it, this is timely in uh, the respect that we are probably about, oh, 45 days away from opening the plaza, having, uh, having it on board. We're looking at having a soft opening St. Patrick's Day weekend, and 7th Street won't be done by that date at this point, but uh, all the construction will reach a substantial complete point uh, by the 31st of March. Uh, and if you haven't heard already, the grand opening is scheduled for the 29th of April at 10 a.m., and we'd like to have you all there. Uh, I think this particular venue is a classic case of a, of a perfect harmony in a public-private partnership effort. This has been a huge uh, project. Uh, our budget to start with was about $9.6 million. Uh, obviously, you saw in the presentation this morning that 3.435 million of, of transient guest tax dollars were dedicated to this project. And it's greatly appreciated, but I think the, the message here is what will happen and, and the benefits that will be gained from that investment. It's a quality of life investment in Topeka that will have economic impact uh, it will have, obviously, quality of life impact. But the one message I would like to leave you with as you, uh, Mike's been on this board before, or on this committee, and we have two new members, and we're looking forward to working with you. And, and if there's anything I can do to help uh, maybe give you a little bit of background from our perspective, from the Lodging Association perspective. But think about the synergy between travel and tourism and what it brings to the community. For every um, transient guest tax dollar that is generated as a result of a hotel stay, there is a corresponding increase in sales tax revenue that goes along with that. So beside, and that's not even counting the economic impact of those travelers and tourists in our community buying, uh, eating in our restaurants, buying groceries, buying fuel, whatever. Uh, so when you, when you think and you get into this process this, this year of, of budgeting for the use of transient guest tax dollars, keep that in mind. Um, I would answer any questions while I'm here, but uh, that gives you a quick update on the progress of the plaza. We're looking for a huge um, opening week. The, the, as I mentioned, the grand opening date is the 29th of April, but we're going to hit the ground running. John Knight and his organization with Spectra uh, is really uh, digging deep to create a, a, a mass of events that will just be ongoing from the day the plaza opens. So that time period between the soft opening and the grand opening will be kind of maybe what I guess the best expression would be laid back a little bit. The water features, the water fountains themselves will not be operational for grand opening or for uh, the soft opening weekend because mid-March is still, you know, a little bit frigid at times, and we don't want to charge those fountains up with water until we know we're beyond any kind of a freeze uh, cycle that could, could endanger that. The, the plan right now is to unveil the fountains on grand opening day, uh, 
with a water show that evening um, under the lights. And I can tell you, having seen the first uh, song that has been programmed to the fountains, uh, you're in for a real surprise. So any questions for me, I'll be back. I'm, I'm pretty much a permanent fixture at these <laughs> committee meetings and, and city council meetings. Uh, but uh, feel free to give me a call if you got questions uh, about anything related to transit guest talk, ta guest tax dollars. So, thank you. Kurt. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. Can I see? Oh, Councilwoman Alcala. I also wanted to note that uh, one of my constituents is here, Tom Underwood, with No Toe, and I didn't know if you came to say anything, but sure would like to. Hear any words you have to say after Mr. Bell. after Mr. Bell? Good morning. My name is Mike Bell, Vice President of Visit Topeka, and thank you for uh, recognizing me in the audience. Always going after Kurt. I got to check off my boxes because he already <laughs> said a few things here. Um, one, I just want to quickly talk about Visit Topeka. Uh, we, of course, uh, are, are the marketing arm for our of our destination. We reach out uh, statewide, regionally, and of course nationally. And one thing I really wanted to talk about, uh, one of the kind of things uh, that was mentioned was diversity and how we are, we work with diversity. And uh, a really big thing I'm excited about happening in April is Topeka will host its first ever, uh, as far as I can find back in records, uh, National Travel and Tourism Show. So we'll be bringing in the African American Travel Conference and it is a uh, conference of tour planners from around the nation that are coming into Topeka uh, to talk about travel, uh, talk about uh, our destination, and really we have an opportunity to showcase what we have here in Topeka. Uh, it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have one really specific uh, destination uh, or tourist spot, which was the Brown versus Board National Historic Site. If that uh, entity wasn't in Topeka, we probably wouldn't be able to host a conference like this because we have uh, produced that much enthusiasm for African-American travel. Of course, that's not the only thing we, we've done. We've got a big thing uh, out south in June called the Heartland Stampede that we, uh, we were able to help secure here in Topeka. Uh, 30,000 people spending a lot of dollars in our community, not only in the hotels, but also, uh, as Kurt mentioned, the sales tax, which is extremely important. Um, I too uh, try to come to all these meetings and, and be present definitely when you, uh, when you need information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm more than happy to go over any of the information and, and uh, just help in the process and learn about TGT. So with that, I stand for any questions. I have a question. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so I've heard some rumblings that there may be more interest by uh, Visit Topeka on cultural tourism. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think that there are a number of hidden gems that Visit Topeka could benefit from looking at, and mm -hmm. that is in the communities of Oakland and North Topeka. We probably have more mural art, uh, you know, in the Our Lady of Guadalupe community than perhaps put together of what we have in Topeka. And it is a uh, cultural, ethnic in nature that tells a story of Topekans, an often unheard story besides what Visit Topeka does with the fiesta. So I think my, my uh, suggestion with what you all do would be to try to widen your scope um, because there are a lot of hidden treasures here where there could be uh, uh, tours like you see uh, in, in bigger cities with the beautiful cemeteries that we have here, taking them to a dining location, whatever. I think that there needs to be a little bit more thinking outside the box because there are a lot of specific parts of this community, uh, and, and I would say NOTO is one of them as well that we have in District uh, 2, but across the city, that could certainly help and do help already with increasing tourism. Absolutely, great, that's a, a wonderful point. Uh, actually, our, our new uh, visitor's guide's coming out here, maybe next week should hit the shelves. One piece we do take a look at is murals, and I tell you what, in just talking about uh, African-American travel in the past six months, I've learned more about 
uh, the Bottoms area in Oakland. I've learned more about uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, there's a lot of, um, like you say, small niche pieces that I think just talk about a greater cultural and, and uh, uh, tourism ecosystem that we can develop. Uh, there's a lot of stories out there to tell, and I think that it's important that we take every story and uh, figure out where its place is and how we can tell that story from our community. Okay. And, and Noto, you just mentioned Noto. Uh, we met with Tom, and, and uh, that, that is a great piece that we've found that folks just love to, to gravitate towards. And we try, our, we, we try to promote anybody coming in on a first Friday. We tell them, uh, your convention may be, get, may be here, but you got to get in and get early for those uh, first Friday over in Noto. So uh, it's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me to uh, make some comments. I'm Tom Underwood. I'm the executive director of the Noto Arts Entertainment District. I've been with the district just a bit over two years. Uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just reflect some of the comments that have been made. I mean, we are about quality of life. We've done some things. Or our primary focus in the two years I've been there is trying to enhance the overall visitor experience, which not only improves the overall quality of life for the merchants and the business that are down there, but I think it extends to the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we're trying to cast a broader net. It's more, Noto's more than two blocks. It's more than a First Friday event place. It's a place that people are living and working and doing business um, seven days a week. And so we really have been trying to promote that notion. I hope you know we recently built a park. Uh, we're very proud of the park. We're very proud. I think it's made a significant impact on the district. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many people who are driving by slow down to look at the park. We're not quite done yet. We have some art sculptures that we need to be placing, some other lighting that we're, we're going to be doing. Uh, but that park in and of itself uh, was a significant addition to the district. And so we're looking at more and more programming uh, through in, not only at Redbud Park, but other places throughout the district. And we have a lot of big plans also throughout the summer, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, we don't get transit guest tax. I hope that changes in the future. Uh, certainly that's part of the reason why I come to these meetings as often as I can in regards to seeing how NOTO fits in. Based upon Visit Topeka's own uh, uh, research that they've done, NOTO is the third, uh, third highest ranked uh, tourism place in the area. We follow behind Lake Shawnee and the Capitol. So we get stories all the time. In fact, just not too long ago, we had somebody, a couple from Maryland, I believe, the state of Maryland that came in. His bucket list was to hit every uh, pro baseball stadium in the country. Her list was to hit every state capital. They stayed in Kansas City. They went to the Royal Stadium. They went to the Capitol, and they heard about Noto. So they came down to hang out in Noto. So we see it on a regular basis. Did they spend the night here? No, they didn't. They went back to Kansas City that night. But while they were here, they ate, they shopped, they filled up their gas tank, they did those kinds of things. So we do have an economic impact or in regards to the tourism dollars to the people who are visiting our areas. And I think people recognize that Noto is one of the places to come when they come to visit this area. So any, any questions? I just want to say you guys did a good job. Thank you very and, much. Uh, as, you know, and we've talked about, and I was talking with Sarah uh, Fazell with Arts mm -hmm. Connect about branching out into more diversity in art right. as well, which I think will be an added boost because of we, as we've talked about looking at the East Coast, West Coast, and those driving factors when you go and look at art galleries, art museums, uh, et cetera, and then do your dining and shopping. Yes. A lot of that diverse element helps draw in additional traffic that can be part of that traffic too that Absolutely. stays overnight. So thank you for coming up to speak. Thank you for inviting me. Anyone else out there? There's only one person left. Man, you got anything? You know? <laughs> All right. Well, here's what I would like to do, if it is so okay with everybody. I would like to look at scheduling a meeting in the next 30 days, and I would like to ask, I guess it would be six groups, the four who get 1%, um, Visit Topeka and the Plaza, um, to come and give 10 minutes or less. It does not need to be a dissertation. Right? But we'll even time it, but just... Give us an opportunity once we get those reports to just ask some follow-up questions, just get an update on where things are at, just, you know, look under the hood a little and just 
a polite little, hey, here's, here we are, here's what's going on. You did a little of that today over there, but um, give us a chance to, to ask that. Um, and don't read too much into this, but I will be more comfortable moving on our preliminary budget for the 2021. If we do that, then I will if we don't. Um, but don't, like I said, don't read too much into that. But it would just make me, one, be new, and two, um, I think it's just good to do that every year before the budget process. Um, so once we get that scheduled, I don't know, either staff can reach out to those groups and ask them to be here, or I'm happy to do it. Um, I would stress to them that they need to send somebody. I understand dates can be tough and schedules are busy, but they need to send somebody. So um, that would be, you know, that's my very polite but stern request to them. You can put that in there. Councilman Duncan says, <laughs> make sure somebody comes. Um, so that would be my, if that's okay with the other two of you. That's a good sort idea. Of, just yeah. sort of give us a chance to talk to everybody and a little more time to ask some questions. Do we vote on that? Huh? Is that something we vote on? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Okay. I think you want, to say, you want to say no, Spencer, not if you don't want to. <laughs> um, I don't know, how do, we usually, just, we use, how do we usually schedule these meetings? You'll just, like we did last time. <laughs> So you can schedule them now. Okay. I mean, if we want to pull up calendars and look and just find a date and a time, um, the place takes a few minutes. Usually, I don't know what sure, this room it. or where it's going to be. But I mean, you want to look. If you want to look at your calendars and we can at least set a date, that'd be fine. Works for me. Okay, I'm good. So that would be what? Mm -hmm. Two. I used to be a paper calendar guy, and then my wife said, mm -hmm. "You're an idiot. Get it on your phone." Never that one. So now I'm all on my. Uh, that's fine, either the week of the 23rd or the week of the 30th into April. I don't know when holidays are this year but, or graduations or any of that. But, uh, 23rd is good for me. 23rd works for me. Uh, April? Works for me. Uh, of, of March. Of March. Works for me. Does that work? Nick doesn't care. Nick will be here. <laughs> Nick will be gone. Uh, as far as we know, staff can make that work. We'll, we'll make sure that someone's there. 23rd of March, yep. Same time. Same time. Same time. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. You'll let us know where. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Now or never. So. All right. Would you like us to adjourn anyone? Motion. Then we're adjourned. We don't do a motion to adjourn. I don't think we're, we don't need it.